Uh, my name is Clay Tabor. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. Yeah, and today I'll be talking a little bit about simulations that we're planning to do. So we haven't really done much yet. We just got this allocation a few months ago. We're planning to look at high resolution simulations of the last glacial maximum. And this is work I've done in collaboration with quite a few people at the University of California, Davis, uh, the University of Arizona, and Vanderbilt. So um, in line with what they suggested, we um, use blue waters to simulate past climates. And I know this is a fairly broad audience, so why do we even care about simulating past climates? Well, um, I'm sure you all are familiar with, we are now emitting a whole bunch of anthropogenic greenhouse gases and aerosols that are um, rapidly changing our climate. And in the next century to millennia, we may be in a very different climate state than we are in currently. Um, but a lot of the climate models we use are really set up um, and do well in present day climate states. Um, but there's a lot of parameterizations that we're not sure how well they'll perform under a very different future climate state. Fortunately, we have millions of years of Earth's history that we can look back upon for different climate states. Um, so we use proxy records to try and reconstruct things like past temperature and precipitation. And then we can use these models that we're using to forecast future climate change with boundary conditions of these past climate states to try and see how well the models can simulate very different climate um, regimes. Um, so if the models do a good job in these past warm and cold states, it'll give us confidence that the parameterizations in place are doing probably a pretty good job in the future. Um, and if they have disagreements, we can look to where these disagreements occur and try and get a better handle on what things forcings or parameterizations might be leading to these disagreements. It's also interesting just from a dynamic standpoint, looking at these past states. So specifically, um, I and our group uses blue waters to simulate hydroclimate change in California since the last glacial maximum. So the last glacial maximum was about 21,000 years ago. Sea level was about 125 meters lower than present day compared to the pre-industrial. Um, CO2 was about 90 parts per million lower. Um, and climate was probably around five degrees or so um, cooler than pre-industrial, maybe six or so than present day. And we're focusing on California for several reasons. One, um, California, if it was its own economy, would be the sixth largest in the world. So it's obviously very important from that standpoint. Also has a very large population. Um, and it's um, nice because there's quite a few proxy records from that area. Um, and we also know that California is a fairly drought prone region. They, um, a lot of California recently came out of one of the worst droughts in recent memory. Um, and when we look into the future and try and understand how um, the hydrologic cycle will change in California, there's some disagreement between models. And so it's good to try and understand the dynamics of the system better, which we can do by looking in the past, and also see how well the models can um, simulate these past climate states. All right. So um, the time period we'll be looking at is the last glacial maximum and a little bit into the deglaciation as well. Um, and so there had been some preliminary um, earlier modeling work done to try and understand how the system had changed um, when you have the presence of these very large ice sheets over North America and Western Europe. Um, and what these early experiments showed was that you had changes in your storm track actually with your um, polar jet moving around these large ice sheets leading to a southward displacement of some of the storms. And in doing so, that led to um, very different uh, hydroclimate of the western US. And so there's been a lot of different proxies to confirm this, um, but both the models and the proxies tend to agree that um, er present day areas that are arid, such as Nevada, were actually covered by large lakes around the last glacial maximum. Um, and so um, lake records, paleobotanical records, and oxygen isotope records, which I'll be talking about in a second, all suggest that this region was significantly wetter at the LGM, and that there are some abrupt changes going through the deglaciation um, associated with various different changes in ice sheet uh, geometry, as well as things like the uh, Atlantic Meridiano overturning circulation. So I mentioned I'll be talking uh, a little bit about oxygen isotopes today, um, and that's because um, some of my collaborators are looking at records that involve oxygen isotopes, and we can also use these climate models to actually simulate the oxygen isotopes as well. 
Um, and so oxygen isotopes, in this case, I'll, I'm referring mainly to oxygen 16, which is the most abundant isotope of oxygen on Earth, makes up about 99.8 or so percent of all oxygen. The remaining 0.2% per is oxygen 18. Um, and these are both stable isotopes of oxygen, and so they don't change through time or decay. And uh, they're um, dependent on temperature, um, their fractionation is dependent on temperature, and they can be used as a tracer of hydrologic change. And because there's a lot of different proxies out there that have oxygen in them, we can look at um, the changes in the oxygen isotopes within these proxies to try and understand how the hydrologic system has changed in the past. Um, just uh, a little bit of terminology here. I'm going to be using delta 18O. Um, not very much in this talk, but it's really just the ratio of 18 to 16 O in a sample minus 18, 16 O in a standard divided by the standard times 1,000. Um, if I say something like depleted or lighter, it means there's relatively more 16 to 18 O, so the delta 18 O value becomes um, smaller, and a high value or enriched or heavier, it means more 18 O in the sample. At its most basic, um, you have something like this, where you have a source of water. Say you have the ocean with a delta H0 value of around zero. Water evaporates from that surface. Um, the 16O preferentially goes into the vapor, so that's the um, higher energy state. So the vapor is more depleted than the ocean surface, and then that vapor transports somewhere, say over land or up over mountain range, and begins to rain out. The initial vapor, or the initial rainwater coming out, is relatively enriched in 18O, and the vapor becomes more and more depleted as you go and rain out more and more. And you can use this to try and track hydrologic change in present day and in the past. In reality, it's much more complicated than that. Um, there's many different processes that can lead to changes in your oxygen isotopic um, composition of a record. So it can be very difficult to say what this record's actually recording, even though you might have a significant shift in the record itself. So you can have changes in the source delta 18O, changes in circulation, changes in the amount and efficiency of the precipitation, changes in temperature, and they can all be influencing the change in the delta 18O you have at a particular location. And of course, then you add in the complexity of changes through time, and it becomes even more um, difficult to decipher. Um, with that said, the records that we're going to be using to try and compare models to proxies and understand hydroclimate change in the past are known as speleothems. These are cave records of stalagmites and stalactites, and they record calcium carbonate um, that has an oxygen isotopic signal in them. So you may have rainwater or groundwater that goes into the cave karst system. Um, and as that water drips into the system, um, the calcium carbonate gets deposited. And over thousands of years, you record a very nice continuous delta 18 signal of climate change um, that can expand over thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. It's also a very nice proxy because you have very nice absolute dating. So you use uranium thorium dating to get at very precise ages in the past. And so you know exactly when these delta 18 changes occurred. So um, when we look at these records in the western US since the last glacial maximum going into the deglaciation, um, we see a lot of noise and variability in these records. Um, and so there's some type of latitudinal patterns, but there's also variability over very small scales. Um, and so that brings us to some of the reasons why we're trying to do these higher resolution simulations to try and better understand the local and regional scale variability. All right, so on to the modeling part and why we're using blue waters. Um, we're going to be using the community earth system model. Um, in this case, um, community earth system model version 1.2, um, slightly different than some of the simulations that um, Susan was talking about. Um, and what's unique about the version of the model that we're using is we have water isotope tracers within the model. So the water isotope tracers are um, circulating through the hydrologic cycle and fractionation, fractionating based on um, known values. And we have both hydrogen and oxygen isotopes within the model. And it's in a fully coupled configuration. So we have dynamic atmosphere, ocean, land, sea ice, and runoff components. And there's several papers out on these isotopes in um, CESM. Um, and so they look to them for more details about how well they compare with observations. Uh, but generally speaking, we capture a lot of the variability um, and the spatial pattern of delta 18 quite well. So here is um, delta 18 precipitation from the model. 
Um, and uh, all the dots are observations of delta H and O precipitation. So the model seems to be doing fairly well. We can also look in the ocean and see that the spatial patterns um, represented by the model on the right compare quite favorably with um, reconstructions based on ship measurements. And so we're going to use this um, model for a series of um, deglacial um, time slices. Um, so we're looking mainly at climatological changes here. Um, and I'll be focusing primarily on the pre-industrial control simulation in this case and in the last glacial maximum simulation. So we've changed the ice sheet geometry based on reconstructions of the LGM. We changed the orbital configurations, um, the greenhouse gases based on ice cores, et cetera. And we put them into the model and run them for uh, a long period of time. And the reason, um, well, first of all, the computer system model is, is quite complex on its own. Um, but the reason we need a whole bunch of computing powder, uh, power for these is twofold. First of all, we don't know the ocean initial conditions. So um, we have to start with um, kind of a guess at the climate state and then run it for many thousands of years to equilibrate the ocean. So this is quite time consuming and expensive. And we do this with a lower resolution version of the model, in this case, two degree atmosphere with a one degree ocean in order to try and equilibrate this model. Um, and then from there, um, to try and get at this regional scale vari variability of the west coast of the US and better simulate the hydroclimate changes, we need to um, work with higher resolution versions as well, which can be quite expensive. So just moving on to a few preliminary results. These are just looking at the low resolution model. We haven't done the high resolution simulations yet. Um, but here I'm showing annual precipitation minus evaporation at 21,000 years ago. In the top plot and in the bottom plot, I have the difference between 21,000 years ago and the pre-industrial climate state that we're using as a control. And so we're focusing on this west coast of the US right here. Um, and you can see that there is a significant increase in moisture in this region at the LGM as has been shown in previous models. And this is uh, a result of both an increase in precipitation as well as a decrease in evaporation. If we look onto the oxygen isotopic changes from our model, we see that we have a depletion signal over the west coast of the US. And this generally agrees, despite um, quite a bit of noise in the records, um, with the speleothem records that we've seen. So uh, another kind of unique uh, feature of the isotope-enabled community air system model is the ability to tag regions and track the water vapor originating from those regions. Um, and so and to better understand what's really driving these isotopic and precipitation changes, we can look at where the different uh, water vapor sources to the west coast of the US are coming from. And so we've broken down um, water vapor from very dis different regions in the North Pacific, um, and looking at the, the water vapor sourcing from there and where it goes. Um, and so I'm just going to show a kind of few interesting examples. Um, I won't go into the details of all of these results here. So here I'm just showing wintertime um, precipitation coming from the northwest central Pacific tagged region, um, the one I showed previously, so that one right here, and, and where that precipitation is going. So this is the um, amount of precipitation for every grid cell that's coming from that region. And then the change in the amount of precipitation um, coming from that region at the LGM compared to the pre-industrial control. And so you can see that you're getting, we're getting significantly more precipitation coming from the Northwest Central Pacific at the LGM. And this could be related to the southward shift of the storm tracks. Indeed, if we look at the eddy kinetic energy as kind of a um, uh, uh, analog for where we're having changes in storm activity, we do see the southward shift at the LGM as other models have seen. However, we also have this interesting signal coming from the southwest North Pacific, and um, this is likely not driven by storm track changes alone. Um, and so we see um, a lot of moisture coming from this region, and there's significantly more at the LGM compared to the pre-industrial. And this could be related to change in atmospheric river activity. There's been some papers that have suggested that's the case, um, but this is still a work in progress. So we're going to need the higher resolution simulations and higher frequency outputs to really determine if that's the case. 
So um, those different moisture sources um, are a large component of why we have this depleted signal um, and along the west coast at the last glacial maximum. But we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so we're currently finishing up our boundary conditions for these high resolution quarter degree simulations. Um, and so just to kind of highlight the differences here and why it's important, here's our two degree uh, resolution uh, topography. And then this is our quarter degree. And so we're beginning to simulate or actually resolve some of these features from where we get these cave records. Um, and so a little bit more of a direct comparison between the, the, the speleothem records and the model simulations. And we're also going to be getting higher resolution, uh, higher frequency outputs as well. So um, in paleoclimatology, we typically look at climatological averages um, and usually get st stick with standard monthly outputs. Um, but that can be difficult to get really at the mechanisms driving these changes. So even though you might have a good um, comparison with the proxies, you don't really know the underlying mechanisms. So we're going to be having high frequency um, six hourly outputs to look at the atmospheric river changes, um, as well as the change in the storm tracks, in order to really pin down what's driving some of these differences in the hydrologic cycle and in the delta ATNO. All right, so um, just kind of summarizing with the key challenges here, um, I hope it's pretty obvious that it's uh, a fairly difficult thing to do. Um, hydroclimate change is difficult enough in itself, and we're trying to look at it uh, 21,000 years ago. Um, and in order to do so, we, um, I hope I've argued that we need high resolution simulations with water isotope tracers um, to really do more of an apples to apples comparison between what the proxies um, are recording and what the model is simulating. So no more guesswork about, oh, is this delta ATNO signal a result of temperature change or precipitation change? We can directly simulate these delta ATNO values in the model. Why it matters, um, it can help us understand what these proxies are saying, how hydroclimates change through time, and it can improve our understanding of hydroclimate in the western US. Um, I don't think you necessarily need a warm climate analog to better understand hydroclimate change. The LGM and the rapid change of deglaciation can be quite helpful as well. And finally, why blue waters? Well, um, it's a supercomputer, and we need a lot of supercomputer resources to do this. Um, it takes quite a while to spin up these simulations, as I mentioned, thousands of years just to get the ocean into an equilibrium state. Um, water isotopes are also quite expensive, so they add about 50% cost to the standard model configuration. And finally, we need these quarter degree simulations um, to really get at Western, uh, Western US hydroclimate change. And so Blue Waters um, provides that opportunity, and we're very grateful for that. <laughs>